Welcome to Sahara Ventures. We are humbled and honored to host Mr. Musi Tembe Kwayo. And uh, as people are getting in, I'll have to tell you a bit about what Sahara Venture is and what we do. So you are at Sahara Ventures. Sahara Ventures is a group of three companies. We have a marketplace called Sahara Sparks, which has been running for the past six or seven years where we do matchmaking between investors and entrepreneurs, but also we have Startup Accelerator called Sahara Accelerator, where we work with sports revenue businesses to help them try to raise capital. But also we do a lot of consulting work around innovation and tech, and uh, our mission is to basically build innovation ecosystem in Africa. We work with different strategic partners. One of our strongest partners, investor partner and acceleration partner is my growth fund, an organization that is being run uh, by Boosie Jim Choir, and we are very excited to have him today. Uh, before we start, I would like to recognize some few people. Uh, I'd like to recognize the uh, CEO of Tanzania Startup Association, Mr. Manolo. Uh, so we, we, we are trying to Creative or conducive environment for startups in Tanzania, and I'm very honored to be among the founding and board members of the Tanzania Startup Association. But also, there are some people from the government, very senior people, have been told the commissioner from the central bank. So, um, without wasting time, how do you want to do this? I start with my question. No, 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 I, I, uh, I am your guest. I'm oh, guest. okay, great. Uh, I asked you for my phone because my questions are in my phone. I think it was here. Okay, I think someone yeah. Okay, well, I'm bringing it. Um, I won't ask you who is Bussy because everybody knows. <laughs> He's trying to ask Rambo, Sylvester Stallone, who are you? Okay, so I will start with the, with the easy ones and then we'll go to the difficult ones. So the easy one is there's a lot of things that have been happening in the in the in the innovation and entrepreneurship scene mm. in Africa. Mm. Uh, the amount of capital coming into the continent has gone mm. high, five times, five times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, businesses are raising enough capital now. Mm. Uh, we are seeing the emergence of kings, Kenya, Nigeria, Egypt, and South Africa. Ghana. In your own perception, in Ghana, in your own perception. Is this just hype or is it a real thing? No, it's real. It's real and I'll tell you why it's real. First, thanks everybody for, for the opportunity to be here and to share some thoughts with you. And Jumani, to you and the team here, I, I can't tell you how important what you do here is. And let me just, before I answer the question, make the following statement. What Jumani does is very important. Uh, somebody of his caliber and talent can be in many other parts of the world for much larger organizations, earning a lot more money with a lot less stress. <laughs> um, so I want, I want to just be clear that what the work that what Jumani does and his peers is so important because there are these unsung heroes who are the reason those of us in capital and entrepreneurs who are in innovation get to exist in the first place. So to you and to the team here, I think the wrong question. So your question was, do I think it's it's a fad, right? And and to any of you that don't subscribe, there are um, there's a phenomenal crowd, Max and Maximilian, who publish you're aware of it, uh, a Substack called the Big Deal. And if you're in the space, you need to subscribe to the Substack. It's market leading. They publish all the information. And they, they put not only the, the quantitative data out there, but they give insights on that quantitative data. So we get to see where's the capital going, yeah. who's deploying, which are the largest funds, how many transactions have they done, in which markets, in which sector, for which stage of growth, right? So, you know, there's the, I think it was, I uh, forget his name, but the most, folk, the most um, uh, uh, famous ice hockey player in the US. And they asked him, they said, what makes you the best ice hockey player in the US? He said, because I pay for where the puck is going. In other words, the ball might be there, but I see where it's going, and that's where I go. And by the time the ball comes there, it finds me there. This is why I'm good. 
And so for any of us operating in this place, you need to learn how to go where the puck is going. And, and typically what happens is human beings act for the environment they're in, not the environment that's coming. And so there are some of you here who might be building solutions or businesses for probably a marketplace that's already mature and, and has very little delta, right? And then there are some of you who are building something that to us right now sounds crazy, but I remember a time five, seven years ago when fintech sounded crazy. Fintech is the new fad now. Mm -hmm. um, my own view is that Web3, which sounds crazy now, is going to be the new fad in the next five to yeah. seven years. Yeah. This is my own view. Mm -hmm. Your question uh, was, do I think it's a fad? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it hasn't even started yet. Okay. So if you look quantitatively at the numbers, what do we know? We know that the deployment of early stage, year on year last year to this, is 4.8x, about 5x. The year prior to last to the year before that was about 4x. The year before that to the year before that was about 2x. So not only is it growing, but it's actually growing at an exponential rate. And here's what you need to understand. Just think about the macros. Insurance penetration in Europe, anyone know the number? Insurance penetration in Africa, anyone know the number? Less than 1%. In South Africa, it's just, over, it's just under 4%. And South Africa is the most developed insurance market on the whole continent. Now, there is no such thing as a person that's not insured. You're just not insured by an insurance company. And for any of you who've ever had parents who came out of a job and didn't have a pension and you had to take care of them, you were the insurance plan. <laughs> right? For any of you that uh, might want to get into a higher education institution when you finish school and your parents didn't save up money, yeah, the job you're about to get, that was your parents' insurance plan. So if you think about something like insurance and how technology can help drive insurance penetration in Africa, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. Think about a, a small size sustenance farmer somewhere in the eastern part of the country, right? Who wants to insure just the batch of crops that he has at that point. It's a game changer. The ability to quantify crop, get the risk, analyze the risk, price the risk, buy the insurance policy and pay for it as and when they need it, game changer. So no, it's not a fad. Mm -hmm. Guys, we're at the beginning of a fantastic Hollywood movie. Mm -hmm. And the Hollywood movie is called Africa Rise of the Stars. Mm -hmm. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, are you in the script? Who are you going to be? And, 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 and who are you going to be? Yeah. There are some who will watch the movie and go, that was a great movie. <laughs> there, are some, there are some who are going to want to make sure that they have a role in the movie. The movie. Some are directing, mm -hmm. some are directors of photography, right? But the movie is being made. Mm -hmm. and. One final note, I feel very passionate about this, that's yeah. why I'm taking yeah. to answer your question. Yeah. Africa has had two opportunities mm -hmm. to define herself. Mm -hmm. Two. Mm -hmm. Two. Mm -hmm. And the last time we had an opportunity to define ourselves was around the time our people took the continent back from colonizers. Mm -hmm. And between the 60s, 70s and 80s, it swept like a wind of change across the continent. Where well, black people said, this is our place. Now, what we've done with it since, that's a different discussion. <laughs> but the point is, there was a time we believed, whether it was Julius Nyerere, or Kwame Nkrumah, when my country, Nelson Mandela, or any other country in the continent, there was a time we were in charge. And then whatever happened, happened. Those are the scenes in the movie we will end out. <laughs> What's happening today is another story such as this. And whereas, 40 years ago, it happened in politics. Mm -hmm. Today, it's happening in business. Mm -hmm. And I think you, all of us here have an opportunity to take the driver's seat in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Because make no mistake about it, it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very exciting time. Wow. 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 So, I'll build up on the same area. But Slight Another major trend. Digital transformation. Yes. 180 billion USD by the side of the African internet economy by 2025. Wow. You did a pilot a new thing. Is it it? Is it a real thing or just hack? This all digital economy, yeah, OIR, IRI. Right. So here's so here's how I, I like to answer that question, right? My, my thing is this, are Africans using the internet and read broadly into the internet, innovation, digital uh, technology, etc. 
Are we using it to build solutions for real problems? Because the greater or less the extent to which we're using the wind of digital transformation to build solutions to real problems is the greater or less the extent to which it is a fad. So, and all you need to do is to look by country at what's driving digital transformation and where is the innovation capital going. And it's different to many other parts of the world. In Europe, digital transformation is about achieving efficiencies and growing bottom line. In Africa, it's just about getting people in the playing field. We do have to be careful of the narrative of growth for the sake of growth, okay. right? We do have to be careful of the narrative of valuations that aren't based on anything real. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen valuations of companies at $100 million that say they've got 10,000 users, mm -hmm. but it's pre-revenue. Mm -hmm. So in my head, I go, but wait. <laughs> so what are the 10,000 users doing? Logging on and logging off and what? Sending each other love notes, right? So, so, so that is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason the Gazelle conversation is important is because, for those of you who don't understand, the Gazelle's a real company in the real economy. Mm -hmm. They embed themselves into the real texture of a community. Mm -hmm. They deliver real services that people can access every day. Mm -hmm. If you're a government looking to build a middle class, to create wealth, and to drive employment, mm -hmm. then the Gazelles is what you want, you want, you want in your country. Mm -hmm. If you're an investor mm -hmm. looking for exit multiples and growth, mm -hmm. The unicorns is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I do think that Africa can probably do with a zebra. Okay. <laughs> the zebra, which is a gazelle and a unicorn kind of tag. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See what I did there? So, so, so that's my view. My, my view is that we need, we need both. Okay. We need both. And, and let me just one final thing. I don't, I don't have a view on any of the media publications writing articles about African unicorns. Um, and the reason I don't have a view is because I think right now, for us, any good PR is PR we should all be supporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Uh, and I just want to make this final point. There was a certain fintech startup, we don't need to mention their names, mm -hmm. who were on the news, who you guys know something fairly recently, mm -hmm. and there were all sorts of statements and allegations made against the founders mm -hmm. in situations that the SEC might get involved. Yeah. As somebody who was just in the US, we were in the US just after that. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that the conversation wasn't about that fintech startup. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about the founders. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about the country. It was about the continent. Oh. Oh. So here's the reason why this is important. When one of us has a blemish, all of us have a blemish. Yeah. This is why, in my view, yeah, just support everybody. Yeah. The pie is big enough, guys. Yeah. If you see somebody doing something in any space, uh, an incubator, an accelerator, a fintech startup, an innovation, just support them. If they look like you and they come from where you come from, just support them. There's the, 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 the old Spanish expression, the rising tides elevate all ships. Yeah. Yeah. Just get this tide to rise. That's yeah. what we need to worry about. Yeah. Wow. Let's change gears a bit. I have founders here and they want to be a founder's question. That was ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, uh, so you constantly talk about something, the growth mindset, mm. in a very simple way. What's a growth mindset? And the growth mindset is the recognition that what you know is not as important as what you're about to learn. Mm -hmm. It's the recognition that as much as you know, the world has multiple times more knowledge for you to acquire. Mm -hmm. And it's the readiness for you to be wrong, mm -hmm. to make mistakes, and to learn. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is, a, by the way, a critical input for founders especially. Yeah. Right? When you're in a large corporate, central bank, you don't have the proclivity to not make mistakes. You've got to make sure that the books balance. <laughs> in our world, it's a little mistake. No one's going to die. You can fix it before. So, 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 so the point I'm making, so, so, so the growth mindset is the is the, is the perspective um, to, it's, it's, it's not minding being wrong mm -hmm. and being okay with being wrong as long as you're willing to learn mm -hmm. and willing to know better. Mm -hmm. They always say, a smart mind is a mind that has changed often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once you know better, mm -hmm. you do better. Wow. Wow. <coughs> Thinking of the gross mindset, what do you do when your business is up to you? Yo. I know the good problem to have. Yo. Oh, wow. What do you do when your business is outgrowing you? 
It's a very good question. You have a business, you have spent years, now you sit down and reflect on like, what have I created? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I don't know that there is an answer to this. I think, <laughs> no, 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 I, I'm not being facetious. I think that, I think that it depends on whether or not you believe mm -hmm. what you have accomplished mm -hmm. is more important than the mission mm -hmm. behind what you've accomplished. Okay. So, if you're building something that is outgrowing you, mm -hmm. all that tells you is that there is a mission far greater than you yeah. that you're serving. Mm -hmm. Now, most people, human beings, generally are egocentric. So, what you want to do is to hold the reins mm -hmm. and and to be and to be the person driving it. Mm -hmm. um, the smart thing to do is to look for a way to either one build up your own capacity, or two, perhaps bring on a more mature mm -hmm. um, a set of skills and competencies. Mm -hmm. Here's the reason I hesitated to ask your question. Yeah. Because I know more than one founder, mm -hmm. and the streets are littered with founders, mm -hmm. who had that problem, yeah. went and found somebody who was a gray, mm -hmm. a gray hair and a beard, mm -hmm. who came into the business mm -hmm. under the pretense that they were more mature and more developed, mm -hmm. and then they destroyed it all. And, and there are many stories like this. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when the business is not growing you? The first thing I would say is pray. <laughs> <laughs> And pray for wisdom, <laughs> pray for the ability to make good decisions. Um, and, and the second thing I would, I would say is be, be, be deliberately intentional, deliberately desperate, and massively intentional about surrounding yourself with people mm -hmm. who know much more than you. Mm -hmm. Let me use a quick tech example. There's a guy I find fascinating in the world right now. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm trying to read as much as I can on this guy. And the first time I actually got to meet him, so when I first moved to Dubai, mm -hmm. I had a couple of meetings with people, and one of them was with the Minister of the Future. And they've got a Minister of the Future in Dubai. <laughs> this is not a joke. They've got a, minister of artificial, they've got a Minister of Artificial Intelligence. So there's a Minister of Artificial Intelligence, a Ministry of Tolerance, and a Ministry of the Future. It's Dubai. And, uh, and so the reason why Dubai is the future is because they've got a ministry building it. The future doesn't happen to Dubai. I mean, it sounds silly, but you must think about this. The future doesn't happen to Dubai. Dubai happens to the future. Yeah. Whereas for a lot of us, regulators find themselves trying to catch up because they're playing tomorrow's game using yesterday's playbook. Yeah. Dubai's like, where's tomorrow? And how do we start crafting that playbook today? They released the program, Fazar released the program. Some of you here who are in the crypto space would know. You've seen what they do with the DMCC. They've created a regulatory environment. They've created a sandbox, licensing, and a whole host of things. It's probably the easiest place now to start a crypto business, is either Dubai or Bahrain. So this is why. What's the largest crypto platform in the world? Binance. Where does the founder CC lead? Dubai. So, I want to meet Sizi because Omar introduced us. Okay. And here's why the reason I find this guy fascinating. Mid 30s, late 30s, mm -hmm. and he's built a financial institution with layers of complexity, regulation, rules, wow. geographies, countries, product set, platforms that would rival the complexity of financial systems in many medium sized countries. Let me say differently. It's probably easier for him to go into certain countries and buy the largest banks and financial services companies in those countries. Time the most effective way yours and my cousins living somewhere in the diaspora will send money to our aunts and uncles living somewhere in Africa will not be fiat. Mm -hmm. It's going to be through crypto. You know, in South Africa, if you want to bring money into the country, yeah. and I know this, as if you want to send money out of the country, you've got to get clearance first. The money just, because we've got, we've got exchange controls. The money doesn't just go in and out, right? There is a balance sheet run by the state, mm -hmm. and, and that balance sheet run by the state through the instrument of, of the central bank governs how much money you get in and out of the country. So what do you think happens then to all of these amazing uh, um, uh, tech developers and web developers sitting in Nigeria? We've got a suite of tech developers from Cyprus sitting in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You know how we pay them? 
came through the Naira. Okay. Do you get it? Yeah. <laughs> you don't get it. <laughs> right? So, so my answer to your question is this: is it's a it's an effective way to build strategy. Mm -hmm. But having said that, guys, I think the most important thing sometimes for you to do as a founder mm -hmm. is just focus on the problem in front of you that day. Just mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> make sure your business is washing its face. Um, yeah. Okay, so two last questions that I can open up to the audience. And these are like selfish questions. These are mine. Mm -hmm. These are mine. Um, how do you manage your personal brand and the business brand? So, so how do you balance between BT and my growth fund? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so on the thing about personal branding, I think actually building a personal brand is much simpler than most people think it is. I think when you're building a personal brand, ask yourself, what is the one word that when people say it, they must think of you? Mm -hmm. Many years ago, I had a PR company. Around the time my personal brand really accelerated. I hired these guys, and they came, I remember Simone coming to my office, and we were sitting and talking, and she said to me, so what do you want to do? I said to her, anytime somebody says the word entrepreneur, I want them to see my face. So that means messaging, content, all of it, it's going to be around what? Entrepreneur. Does it make sense why the master classes? Yeah, yeah. Why the lives? Why the videos? Why the, do you get it now? Because that's the word I want to own. Now it's not to say that's, that's all I am. It's not to say that's all I know. It's not to say that's all I do. It is to say that's all I want people to think of when they say my name. So for any of you here who are wanting to build yourself as a personal brand, the question for you is what is the one word that must be synonymous with you? Once you've decided what that word is, here is the most effective way to build a personal brand. Tell people something they don't know regularly. <laughs> it's actually not rocket science. <laughs> so I find people, like, I see people building personal brands and you start developing a logo. <laughs> And now you've got a logo, you've got a whole design, you've invested money, you've got designers, you went and bought a font. For what? <laughs> Here's what you should do. Whatever you want your name to be. Let's say you're in this room and you want in the Tanzanian market that when anybody thinks digital marketing, your name comes up. That means from today until day whenever, every single day, You've got to tell people in Tanzania something about digital marketing that they did not know. And what it does is it establishes you as an authority. So the next time they want to know about that thing, naturally, where do they go? To you. To you. It doesn't matter what the logo is, right? Hey, but you guys are busy, they're doing logos. <laughs> And then only on your second question about you know separating the BT brand from the NGF brand, this is like a constant tune-up for us in the business. Okay. We never have a perfect answer to it. Okay. But here's kind of how I like to think of it, and I'd like to think the rest of the business thinks of it like this: mm -hmm. is that that Vusi Tembuwaya and the business aren't competing; mm -hmm. that the one feeds the other. Oh wow! Right. So wow. so we don't really care how we get invited into the room. Yeah. We do care that when we're in the room. We're going to sell something. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we care about. So it's like, okay, so whether we're in the room because Busi Tembuwaya is six foot two, very good looking, well spoken, <laughs> and not trying to win, or because we're in the room because my growth fund is a you know phenomenal track record, it doesn't matter. When we are in the room, we must have a singularity of purpose mm -hmm. about what it is that is our playbook and our agenda, mm -hmm. and how do we make that playbook and agenda feature in the room. Yeah. That's it. Wow. So building a personal brand and a business brand. Don't think of these as one pulling left and the other pulling right. Mm -hmm. Think of these as a very simple thing, and Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this. Mm -hmm. Attention. Mm -hmm. Whether it's your business that gets people's attention, or your name that gets people's attention, what's important is getting attention. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because once you've got the attention, you can sell whatever you want to sell. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that's good now. Uh, I know you like to talk about this about black left and generational wealth. Left tax and generational wealth. Man. <laughs> You're trying to get me kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> What about them? What about them? 
if you had to go back in the 20s right now and just families to create generational wealth for your family, what are the things would you do and what are the things you would stay away, completely stay away? Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually an interesting question because I'm busy doing them now. Um, so at a personal level, it's just a personal level, I don't, I don't, I, I, I think we need to reframe the word black tax. Because right now it carries this rather negative connotation. Right? Um, and I, I don't know that black tax is how I would frame it because I don't really think of my responsibilities outside of my narrow little scope of influence and family as a tax. I just think of them as responsibilities. That said, I do think you need to be a bit more deliberate especially those of you here who are coming into money for the first time, you're about to reach your first exit, uh, those of you here who've just reached, you know, the three or four X multiply in valuations, you're finally raising some money, you're, you can now begin to start drawing some salary for your business, right? Because some of you here don't really earn what you're worth, right? As those changes are happening, just set very specific boundaries with yourself, not your family. So just with yourself around what can you spend, what can't you spend. And once you have those boundaries with yourself, it's, it's more manageable. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is more manageable to manage the expectations of the rest of your family. Uh, the second thing around black tax is it's okay to say no. It's family. So they might not like you, but they can't kill you. And, and no is no. You, you asked something uh, around this generational wealth, and this is really, really important, guys. Really, really important, right? Just think about yourself and what you are building. Because once you're clear on what you're building, then how to approach the wealth conversation is different. Mm -hmm. If I am um, middle management to executive in a large corporate, my life is such that my income is predetermined, predictable. My increase in my income is predetermined and predictable. I have relative ease in terms of accessing debt capital markets, credit as we call it. And I can live the middle class life with some semblance of normality and comfort, right? So how I manage generational wealth is the following way. First, I make sure that I save. Second, I make sure that I invest and making sure that that which, this is important, I gain I preserve. Okay. The MC Hammer syndrome okay. is the inability to preserve what you've gained. Okay. This is so important. A gainer's mindset and a preservation mindset are not the same. Gaining wealth, accumulating wealth, is being the lion that goes straight into the savannah looking for something to eat and it will kill whatever it finds. Okay. Preserving wealth is once I've killed it, where do I put it? Or do I have to keep killing every day to eat? Yeah. You get it? So for me, the major change was when I realized that I'm actually a fantastic liar. <laughs> I'm great at going out to game. I'm a preservation game is not good. <laughs> so what do you do when you realize your preservation game is not good? You go, okay, so how do I get good at the preservation game? Or how do I get people to help me with the preservation game? And that's an entirely different subject, especially for those of you here who are founders and entrepreneurs. Yeah. Where is your, your business, the ownership of your business, the share of capital, where is it sitting? In your name or in a company? In a company or a trust? In country, out of country? In a tax registered domicilium or not? Free tax, no tax, capital gains? These are things you need to think about. And the best piece of advice I can give you is talk to somebody far more capable than me. Find that, this is a true story, guys. This is, I'm telling you now, because it's something I'm doing. Find somebody who does this for a living. And especially if you are intentional about creating wealth, yeah. you need to build the structures around you for the wealth you're creating, not the, what you've got. Eh? Because a lot of us also like, no, I'll just get a life insurance because so that's where I am. <laughs> <laughs> but where you're going, I mean, you know, you're building something that's gonna give you a $100 million windfall in seven years. Mm -hmm. You can't create the trust when it's at $100 million. Mm -hmm. You've got to start thinking about those things now. Yeah. The, 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 the main point is, Preservation and gain are not the same, uh, sorry, uh, gain and preservation are not the same thing. So if you have a gainer's mindset, get preservation systems around you, 
And if you have a preservation mindset, then the data systems are on you. Just this is the way to do it. Wow. Can you get a clap? Yeah. Yeah, so now I'll go to a meeting for a lady. Uh, so I'll start with Deshi, Vanessa. <laughs> she found. <laughs> she found. <laughs> Talk a lot about your mother's collective groups and all of that. Sorry, whose phone is buzzing? Can we get that to stop? It's very distracting. But <laughs> oh, it's not the phone. Yeah. What is it? It's the water, 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 water dispenser. It's the water dispenser. So it's pretty, stop drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. I know it's a heavy content. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, and it's the same thing, it cuts across, even when it comes to women entrepreneurs accessing funding, it looks like the collective groups work much, much better. Now the finance environment is very unregulated and very sensitive to all of that, that was. How do we take advantage of, how does one take advantage of it? He takes advantage of the collectives to be able to just tap on what is existing to provide uh, access to financing to this group. So ask me that question in English. <laughs> Okay. Um, the collectives, the collective groups. Yes, like a collective investment society. Yes. Right. They're either unregulated or unmonitored or uh, unregistered, informal. Right, right, right. When you look at the formal investment theme yes. data, a yes. lot of very few investment goes to female, female entrepreneurs. Yes, of course, of course. Yes. Okay. So, and given that the fintechs, I mean the finance space is very sensitive, mm -hmm. how does one take advantage of the collectives that are, are regulated, very informal, to still be able to put systems and structure for you to be able to fund the female interface? Now you're asking. Only so, I want to make, so maybe, so let me distill it. So, what you're, so if I think about supply and demand, what you're saying is on the supply side, there is predominantly but not exclusively of female capital mm -hmm. that sits in collective investment schemes mm -hmm. uh, in the stock fails, yeah, we call them the same, and that's not necessarily going into investing in female founders. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, is that the question? Yeah. So the first is that there is, I can think of a lot, top of mind, five different technologies that you can leverage okay. for something around this. In fact, if I think about E and Future Fund, yeah. he actually has something similar, right? Because yeah. Yeah. that's a syndicate financing system, and what they've done is they've built a subscription model. Yeah. So you subscribe, so I'm sure you know, you subscribe, they send you the data on the deals they've done. So they take the upfront risk of finding deals, pricing deals, due diligence, qualifying deals. And when they believe they've built enough investment documentation for a thesis, they then go to the community and say, here's this deal, who here wants to do the deal? And then this, the community makes a subscription agreement. So for me, that's probably the most effective way to do it. Here's what I would say to you though. Um, just be, be very careful of the presumption that what matters to you matters to them. So it might matter to you that female founders raise money. I'm not sure it matters to, to women in a collective investment scheme that female founders make money. I think it matters to women in a collective investment scheme that their money makes money. How the money comes is, you know. Um, and, and this is what I call, it's, a, it's what I call the Robert Mugabe problem. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, so, the Robert Mugabe problem, I don't know if you ever saw the speech where, where Robert Mugabe was speaking at like the United Nations. It's a true story. And so Tony Blair is sitting, he says, Blair! He runs his finger at him. Um, and he says, keep your Britain and leave me my Zimbabwe, right? Yeah. So, so, so the, the, the Robert Mugabe problem was the presumption that, <laughs> it was the presumption that the, the things he was impassioned about were the things that every other Zimbabwean was impassioned about. Mm. And as he executed on his plan, the currency collapsed, the country went into trouble, and what did Zimbabweans do? They left. So as founders and business owners, we, we typically make the same mistake. Mm -hmm. Where you're so passionate about something, you think every person you meet cares about it. Yeah, yeah. So my advice to you would be, make sure on the supply and demand side, make sure that on, on the demand side, where there is a demand for capital, that the return case and return profile stands head and shoulders above any other return profile, regardless of whether or not it's female or black or Tanzanian or any of these things because this is important. 
capital has a supremely monogamous relationship with, with return. Capital will never cheat on return. And you can try and distort that any way you want, but for as long as the system of capital has existed, anytime capital finds the return matrix doesn't make sense, it goes elsewhere. So just build this such that from the supply and the return perspective, the marketplace makes sense. Great, uh, Jocelyn. Thank you, brother. Uh, I'm just gonna be quick. Busi, you are a global citizen. Clearly, Canada is very bad. Um, do you have time with your team? And how do you best invest in your team? Yeah, I mean, I've got time with the team. First, it's built into the calendar. We have regularly scheduled meetings into the calendar. Uh, because, yes, so I can only sit here and be here and talk to you and my brain is not in 50 million other places because I've got people manning those 15 other places, mm -hmm. right? So, so in, you have to think of in, in building a good team. First, before you invest in the one, mm -hmm. just building a good team and surrounding yourself with good people. You have to think of that as an investment in you, not them. Because the greater or less the extent to which you get really good people around you, the greater or less the extent to which you can actually do what you should be doing, and you don't have to worry about what somebody else is doing. But once you've got those people around you, then you need to make sure you give them the, the leeway to run and build and do what they need to do. Um, and as they're doing that, you need to make sure that both of you are still aligned on why you're doing it and where it's going. Good people, this will just work. And if it doesn't work, generally there's something to make to make a tilt off, but yeah, what, it's um, what, what did you, how do you delegate? How do you? We actually just had this conversation today. <laughs> About delegating, right? Yeah. Yeah, delegating is hard. Um, delegating is hard. I had a friend of mine, uh, Michael Yordan, who was the CEO of FNB in South Africa. And I'll never forget, there's actually an interview that I did with him, it's online on YouTube, for our Osmosis series, and I said to him, what is the role of a leader? And he said, a leader's role is to facilitate good decision making. That's interesting. And, and what he really, what he was, and when he double clicks onto it, he goes, if you create an environment where people can make good decisions, by definition, things like delegation take care of themselves, yeah, right? Because they'll make good decisions. Mm -hmm. So how do you create an environment where people can make good decisions? Something to grow. Exactly. So first, you've got to build own internal capacity with those people. Mm -hmm. Second, you've got to make sure that you're aligned on values, mm -hmm. especially those of us here who are startup founders. So many of us are hiring the talent that's available, not the talent that's aligned to your values. Yeah. And so you frustrate them, and they frustrate you. <laughs> you, know, you frustrate each other. So, 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 so there are some of you here who don't delegate to your people because you know they might cut a corner. They might, yeah, that's just a misalignment of values. Right? So I'm telling you now, if you want to, 80% of the headaches of managing people is because you made a decision not based on values. Yeah. Get the values right. Mm -hmm. What do you stand for? What are you about mm -hmm. as a business and as a team? Mm -hmm. And once you get that right, mm -hmm. anyone who doesn't fit that, yeah. I don't care if they are Einstein, mm -hmm. they don't fit your organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because, because once the values are set, mm -hmm. then you know that even if you don't agree with the decision, mm -hmm. yeah. it'll be a decision made within the framework of your wow. values. And, and last thing, last thing, you have to develop the ability to have tough conversations. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not natural to us, human beings don't like conflict. Mm -hmm. You have to get better at having tough conversations. Mm -hmm. And I always say to people, tough conversations make for great teams. Yeah. So having the ability to go, this is an uncomfortable conversation, but we're gonna sit here, we're gonna have it. Yeah. And we might not like each other during it, mm -hmm. we might not even like each other after it, mm -hmm. but we're gonna respect the fact that we had the conversation. Sure. 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 Yeah. So I want to add the question that uh, Jumani had asked before regarding the, your business of growing yourself. So the first question will be, how do you know how fast you should grow? Yeah. And considering you have all the resources, the market is big enough, there's enough opportunity, you can go for every gazelle out there, mm. the lion, mm. you have all the resources you need. Mm -hmm. Should you go for everything mm -hmm. that is out there? That's mm -hmm. the first one. The second question is, should you raise what you need or raise as much as you can get? Oh. Good question. I want to start with the last one first. So, so, and it's, it's a complex question. So do you raise what you need or raise what you can get? Depends on a few variables. And without answering your question, let me, let me give you the variables for you to think about. Yes. Variable number one is what percentage dilution do you want to take off? Yeah. 
because the earlier you raise a higher amount, you dilute more because the valuation growth isn't built in yet. Right? So that's the first thing for you to think about. The second thing to think about is what, what is the speed by which you can deploy the capital you've raised? Because another thing people don't know, by the way, venture firms raise from limited partners. You create a GP structure, you raise from LPs. Yeah. LPs only give you money if you're going to deploy it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a part of how you raise is you introduce the deals you're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. And a VC only deploys the money to a company that's going to deploy it. Mm -hmm. no, one's, no one's going to give you money for you to have sitting in a bank account for any 8% interest, yeah. right? It, it's going to be deployed into the business. Oh, yeah. So for me, those would be the variables. What is your percentage dilution that you're willing to take on? How quickly can you deploy that capital? And, and third is, have you really thought about shareholders' rights, minority protection? Have you built the necessary governance around managing that money? Because, my brother, let me tell you, in a minute to take on somebody's money, the game changes. The game changes. The phone call rings at 11 o'clock, man. And, and it can ring at 11 o'clock. You've got their money. This is governance. So you must afford. You know, when you're, like, when you're on your own business, you have an accountant, you don't have one, an auditor, you don't have one, the minute you take on people's money, you're constantly issuing updates, trading updates. Listen. And then if you're missing an update, you're telling them why. Yeah. You know, so this is a part of the conversation, I think, about raising capital that's not told to founders. Yeah. So the, the, the TechCrunch article goes, X and, X and such raised $10 million. I talk to them six months in. <laughs> Let them tell you about the investor packs and the feedback. You know, I've got, I've got a friend of mine in South Africa who's raised a ton of money for his current business. And he will tell you for free, he said to me the other day, he says 40% of his time goes to investor relations. Wow. 40%. As a CEO, 40% of his time goes to investor relations. Just telling them, I got it. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, man, like it's like, you know, and, and I'm not saying don't do it, I'm just saying make sure you build yourself in this sense. Did I ask you a first question? No. no. What was the first question again? How do you know how fast you should grow? You can have all the resources. That's, that's, such, a tough, that's such a tough philosophical question. There are some people who say that the correct question, I don't know, you ever seen the movie Wall Street? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Have you seen Wall Street 2? No. Shia uh, Shia and um, Michael Douglas is also in the movie. Yeah. Of course, Gordon Gecko. Mm -hmm. But I forget the other guy's name. The one who plays uh, Thanos, mm -hmm. right? And he plays the bad guy in Wall Street 2. Mm -hmm. So Shia LaBeouf is in the office with this guy, and this guy has just screwed Shia LaBeouf out of like a ton of money. Mm -hmm. But the guy who's just screwed him is worth a lot of money. So Shia looks at him and goes, why would you screw me out of $100 million? You're worth like $5 billion. Mm -hmm. and the guy answers the question this way, which is the answer to you. Mm -hmm. He says, in a system of capitalism, the answer to how much money is enough is always more. <laughs> <laughs> so how fast should you grow? The answer is faster. <laughs> as fast as you're growing, mm -hmm. grow faster. Just be very careful. You have some homework? Mm -hmm. This is what I want you to do. When you leave here, go to Google and in parentheses, type in the word controlled growth. When you type it in, there's an article that's going to show up. It's on the third of the search results, excluding the ad. That's how I know whether it's because I read it often. A third article is an article published by MIT, the Sloan School of Management, that talks about how to build controlled growth. I can't recommend this article enough. It gives you the step by step of what to do mm -hmm. to make sure that you're growing at a rate that doesn't miss market opportunity, mm -hmm. but not growing at a rate that's irrational exuberance, doesn't make sense, yeah. and you can't even support it. Yeah. Okay. Control growth. Mm -hmm. There's a question there. Uh, please, uh, and then we'll go on the back. Yeah. Uh, hi, Bozi. Uh, there's two questions. Uh, can be more than one. So I need to know how has uh, your VC experience with uh, my growth fund be uh, on a personal level, but also on a business level. And also, uh, what are the typical type of lessons you learn to give uh, founders, uh, particularly who are trying to raise money from VCs? Sure. I'll start with your second question first. So, um, from a, I mean, mm -hmm. Founders, VCs aren't doing you a favor by meeting with you. <laughs> and they're not doing a favor by investing in you. It's their job. It's what they get paid for. You know, it's a 220 model. 
We ours is a 320 model because we have a lot of value add into the business. But you're charging three percent. Um, you're charging three percent assets under management and taking a 20 percent carried interest on the capital growth, right? That 3% asset under management is for you to actually manage those assets, which means deploying the money into underlying investing companies is my job, right? So when you're meeting with investors, your question should be, how do I help this guy do his job? And this is what almost all founders I find do wrong. You put together your pitch deck and the deck is about you. <laughs> So you meet a VC, I mean, I've seen some shocking stuff. You, you've never been to their website. You don't know who their LPs are. You don't know what their hurdle rate is. You don't know the, the number of transactions they've done before this. You don't know where they burnt their figure, where they earned their multiples. You don't know what is the vintage year of their fund. You don't know the basics. And you come in and tell me all about your FinTech fund. Answer my question. My question is X. So if I'm an impact fund, then you come in and go, of the 17 little scorecards from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Framework that makes up the impact investment categories, which of these investment categories am I after? Yeah. And come in and have that conversation with me. Not some broad conversation that's about your deck. Mm -hmm. right? This is sales 101, brother. Sales 101. You have to, you know, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit like asking a woman for a date. <laughs> You don't go to a girl, ask her for a date, and go, because I'm amazing and I'm super cool. She doesn't care. <laughs> you go to her and what do you say? Oh, you're so beautiful. <laughs> it's all about her, right? Yeah. It's exactly the same when you talk to VCs. The more VCs, VCs, family offices are very difficult because they have a, it's very difficult to access information from, them, from family offices. Our high net worth individuals even harder. But the more VCs have a sense that you know them, and what they want, and what they're about, mm -hmm. and what their investment mandate is. And a lot of the stuff, frankly, is freely available online. Yeah. Just Google them, right? Mm -hmm. The more they're willing to take the conversation with you and listen. Mm -hmm. The second question was uh, lessons from my journey uh, at my growth fund. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, I used to say this to entrepreneurs, I didn't realize I was talking to myself. <laughs> Here's the lesson. It's harder than you think. It takes longer than you thought. Mm -hmm. But it's 10 times worth it. That's the lesson. Yeah. If I knew when I started where I would be now, I wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. I can tell you for free. Mm -hmm. If I didn't start, mm -hmm. hey, I would be rich. Mm -hmm. If I didn't start my growth fund, I'd be multiples <coughs> wealth here. Multiples. <coughs> multiples wealth, I'd be worth much more. <coughs> because I wouldn't have taken my own money and invested it. I wouldn't have taken capital risk. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Because you must remember our journey. It's very different. You know, most guys go and just start. We, we were like, no one's going to give us money, so we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And we did it. And it's, it's painful, it's expensive, it's hard. Mm -hmm. There have been many nail biting moments. So the things I talk to partners about, I know about. Like, you know those months where you go, so do we buy tea or coffee? Because we can't buy both. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, I understand the, the pressure of making sure you've got just the right office, so it makes the impression, but shit, you know, you can still cover your rent. <laughs> I get it, right? I, I, I can tell you for free, several instances where you've got creditors and suppliers that you've got to get a lawyer intermediary to go, look, we can't make these, especially when COVID hit, so go to those people and renegotiate our payment terms. Yeah. So I, I'd like to think, just by God's grace, the reason I have the ability to talk to entrepreneurs is because I'm not just an investor, I am an, I am an entrepreneur. I'm living the reality you are living, right? So for me, the most important lesson, and this is, it took me forever to kind of get this message, what God was trying to teach me, right? Was that there's just no substitute for time. There's no substitute for time. Mm -hmm. Talent, education, qualification, networks, looks, none of it substitutes the amount of time it's going to take to build something long lasting. Yeah. There's no substitute for time. So the biggest piece of advice I can give you is remember these words. Every decision you make, makes you. Every decision you make, makes you. Because the decisions you make reflect your character. And in the arc of time when people look and they try to describe who you are, the answer to that question is the outcomes of the decisions that you've made. So be very careful of the decisions you make. Okay, did I answer your question? 
Mm -hmm. Could I start with Adam and then Mark and then we'll go there? Uh, mine is simple. I just want to take it back. I know this we had this discussion um, on regulatory issues and challenges raised in Africa in Africa context. And um, we understand now a lot of people are coming up with uh, investors readiness programs. But there are the part that is missing with one side and the other. And uh, I want your opinion. What do you think are the challenges as far as raising funds, especially for the African startup companies? I think when we talk about investor readiness, we tend to think of it as buy and sell side, mm -hmm. um, as the two parties to a transaction. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember that in every buy and sell side transaction is the regulator overseas. And where we've been guilty as people operating in the ecosystem, as startup founders, as deployers and raisers of capital, is we've had an investor readiness program that says to the entrepreneur, tick these five boxes and you're investor ready. And that says to the investors, I'll find the entrepreneurs that tick these five boxes. And none of us have taken the time really to go to regulators and go, wait, how do we make sure that we help you do your job better? Yeah. Right? Um, now, just remember this because it's important. Regulation regulates what is happening. You can't write regulation prospectively. You can only write it retrospectively, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which means breaking the law is kind of our job. <laughs> First we break the law, then the law breaks us all. Oh. <laughs> Actually, you must write a piece of regulation in there, right? <laughs> what I would like and what I would hope for is that we would have a lot less acrimonious a conversation, mm -hmm. that we might have the ability to converse with each other, educate mm -hmm. each other, share with each other. So I think about investor readiness mm -hmm. as a triangle. You've got the founders on the one end, the capital managers and asset allocators on the one end, mm -hmm. and the regulator on the other. And all three of us have the responsibility to make sure this, that our market attracts, retains, and grows capital. Mm -hmm. Because, and this is important, your competitor as small um, scale-up and idea-driven enterprise in Tanzania, is not the person doing the same thing down the road from you. Mm -hmm. The internet doesn't know borders. Mm -hmm. So your competitor mm -hmm. is somebody sitting in another part of the world yeah. who can sell to your customers from where they are. Mm -hmm. So it's not worth regulators to shut us down yeah. because it's not as if that demand goes away. It just means somebody else gets to access it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we, need, we certainly need to develop a framework yeah. of conversation in and, and of building with one another. The first question, because you talked about values and how important it is to align uh, your company values to yourself so that when you give results, they're in alignment. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to take back you to the, the FinTech that we are not supposed to mention and the conversation surrounding it because I think that story had a lot of impact um, Let's say, for example, if for the people outside the ecosystem, yeah. for the picture that it drew on the inside, um, the workings of the, of the industry. But then, when I have tried to ask several people about that particular story, and everyone has a similar kind of response, that it's very difficult for black founders to have this kind of spotlight. So we really don't have to you know, go that side but rather support each other in making things right. Mm -hmm. Now I'm thinking long term, what does that mean to new founders? The practices in the industry and the ecosystem at large, mm -hmm. right? That going forward, mm -hmm. are we going to be seeing more and more values and you know, trying to jump ship mm -hmm. so that we can win the prize, whatever that is, instead of actually trying to bootstrap from the bottom level, trying to have proper values, and align them straight in order to have proper functioning businesses. Mm -hmm. That is one. And another one is like, what is what are your takes on capitalism as you know the means of production or the current running of the economy? You really want my view on that one? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, I'm being facetious. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> Somebody once went on Twitter and they're like, yeah. Vusi is even a capitalist. I replied, I said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> then I said to them, I don't mind socialism, but let's start with your things first. 
right? Um, <laughs> changes the conversation. So, capitalism is not a perfect system. It's the least imperfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's the one most akin to natural human behavior. Mm -hmm. And natural human behavior is for every risk I take, I want a proportionate amount of reward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is why capitalism works. Mm -hmm. It isn't to say that there aren't filthy, disgusting t capitalists mm -hmm. who belong in jail cells. Yeah. Of course they are. It's human nature that you'll find those people. People will find a system and exploit it, right? The very history of our continent is an exploitation of our continent by a, capitalist, a global capitalistic system. Mm -hmm. But I've not seen any country that pulled itself out of poverty and created mass wealth, even if the wealth wasn't evenly distributed, without using the system of capitalism. I'm open to being educated. I haven't seen it. People go, China, go to China. <laughs> oh, hands of capitalists in China. They believe in a socialist system. They're capitalists in how they do business. You know, you know they're capitalists and do business? Because if it says made in China, it's cheaper. The difference between China and many other parts of the world is that in China, capitalism is practiced by the state. In many other parts of the world, it's practiced by private enterprise. So they call it state capitalism. It's capitalism. <laughs> It is capitalism, it doesn't matter, it's still capitalism, right? So, so, so for me, capitalism is, is the one that most kind of gets right, this risk-return model. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect, it needs to be adjusted all the time, there are people that exploit it all the time. What you really want, and this is why I think, I think regulators are so important. What you want is if somebody breaks the law, mm -hmm. the punitive measures for breaking the law must be so high so that, that nobody thinks about doing it again. This is what you want, right? Um, then, yeah, the, the, the question about the first one, right? I know some of the people involved in that business. I have no idea whether or not any of the things that were said were true. For me, none of that stuff was ever anything that I've known about. Um, so I can't make a comment past aspersions or even venture uh, an opinion on this. Mm -hmm. The question might be, <clears throat> Was that a, a reflection of the broader ecosystem? Yeah. And the answer might be that if it is, and I'm not saying it is, but if it was true, they wouldn't be the only ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. um, then just the final note. I'm just like, now that we know, how do we all do better? Yeah. Because yeah. I, I think that's what advances us. Yeah. Right? Just, yeah. How do we all do better? Um, African regulators have to find a way to make sure that African innovators don't have to leave Africa to innovate. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so for as long as African founders are registering companies in Delaware because of you know, tax and IP protection and the rest of it, this is going to continue to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in whatever small or minor scale, but we have to find a way to disincentivize it. Because again, we live in a global village. You know, you want to register a company, guys, I'm serious. If you want to register a company on, in Delaware, you go to Harvard Business Publishing, and it's selling. <laughs> so, the world is flat. Yeah. Borders don't exist anymore. Yeah. And in the same way we as innovators are competing in a global context, governments are competing in a global context. So, so I think the, the, you know, the work for us to do is how do we make sure that everybody is doing the work to make sure that... I said to Jumani one time we were talking, and I said Jumani and I were having a discussion about how many African unicorns. And as we were, as we were listening, I was like, I'm not sure we can call those guys African. <laughs> like, I know they say they are, but where are they? Which airport do they lend in? Because I've never seen them land at that airport. Um, that article was a fantastic wake-up call just for all of us to be like, yo, guys, we can do better. Yeah. Whether it was true or not, I, I don't know. Do I have a I don't ton, know. Of, let me just tell you, I have a ton of respect for everybody involved with that particular business. Yeah. Because what they have built, yeah. even just as an example to the rest of us, yeah. is very, very inspirational. Yeah. You know, they broke boundaries. Yeah. One that they did it, yeah. 
Second, that they did it how they did it. Third, as quickly as they did it. And fourth, and let's be honest, that they look like us. <laughs> let's be honest, guys. Because yeah. there wasn't a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah. Right? There wasn't a lot of us. You know the, that old JC expression, my homie said, oh, there ain't many of us. And told them, less is more, nigga. Yeah. <laughs> right? So for me, this is, and you will notice this as generally as just my approach to things. I don't try to bash. I try to learn, to inspire. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm imperfect. So who am I to stand on the altar of something and go, what they yeah. yeah. Learn, inspire, and hope people do better next time. Great. I think you're talking about the power of Nando's, mm. and it was about when you're building your brand, you can't afford to have a people. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's take that as an example, and then we reflect it back on you, especially <coughs> in your formative state, stages of your business and also your personal brand. What was that one thing that you felt was necessary for your brand but was conflicting with your ego? No. How did you handle it? I mean, I mean, the first there were several. Um, <laughs> they really were. And, and the other thing for you to think about is, so you're talking about George Sombonos, who yes. was the founder of uh, Chicken Licking. Yes. I, I know, I know Robbie Brosnan as well, the founder of Nando's. And again, very similar story, right? So Robbie Brosnan was working for an accounting firm. I think he was working at Ernest & Young or Price Waterhouse. In fact, it was, it was called Cooper's and Library at the time, or something like this. And they sent him on an assignment to do an audit for a small company somewhere in Joburg town in South Africa. And for lunch, he went to this place where they were selling chicken called Fernando's. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called Nando's, mm -hmm. right? And he says he tasted the most incredible chicken in his life and it changed his life. And that's why his view about building Nando's was that they're gonna change the world one chicken at a time. I don't know what they've done with it, but you know, like, um, So, and when he started, by the way, he bought what was then Fernando's with two Nando's stores. Now they're all over there in Australia, they're in the UK, they're in the US. I think they're well over a thousand stores. Uh, and he himself worked the store. He himself worked the stove. He himself grilled the chicken. Because how do you sell something you've never tasted? Right? And I think there's a, there's a big lesson for us living in the Instagram generation. Because yeah. yeah. you know, that's not a picture of entrepreneurship in Instagram. <laughs> go, to, go to Instagram right now, search entrepreneur, CEO. private jet, G class, <laughs> my bar, Dubai, <laughs> who buy, you buy. Right? <laughs> this, is the, this is the, if you Google that term, like yeah. entrepreneur is like glamorous now. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but it's rough. <laughs> entrepreneurship is forgotten hair appointments, uh, you know, like unclipped nails, <laughs> missed debit orders, a stressful partner, sleepless nights. This is entrepreneurship. This is entrepreneurship I know. I don't know about these people flying private jets. I'm like, what do you mean there's a jet? <laughs> I would do this. I went to Gulfstream website. I was like, how much is this jet? <laughs> And then I figured out, I don't know if you know this, do you know that in the US, they've got an Uber, but for jets. Okay. And so I was like, oh, there's another one. Well, here you are. You're about to leverage your entire company's balance sheets. Uh, Uber. Yeah. He's gonna, he's gonna go into a capital raise, Series C, $100 million, and take $60 million, he buys the Gulfstream. And yet, the person you just watched, he, he rented that. From his, he paid $30,000, they picked him up in one state, landed in another, he stood at the door, like this, <laughs> took a picture, and now, he's like, you, you understand? So listen man, all of us, and I, and I think the more we do this as entrepreneurs, the farther we're gonna get. Let's just be real and honest. Yeah. Can we be real and honest? Yeah. The first 10 years of doing what we do is shit. Yeah. It's tough. Mm -hmm. There's no return. We take all the risks. We're stressed. Half the time we're about to lose our brain. Mm -hmm. The people in your life think you're stupid, crazy, or both. <laughs> if you're dating, like if you're dating, it's an impossible thing because she's like, why don't you pick me up at 5 o'clock? I'm working! <laughs> I'm working on the radio at 5 o'clock! Somebody who works in a call center. <laughs> she knocks off at five, you're just about to sit down and answer your emails. Because you are out seeing clients or talking to your team or somebody's upset or a delivery wasn't made. It's five o'clock, I'm just about to sit down and call you. Stop calling! If I want you, I'll find you. <laughs> and this is the first 10 years. And then, and then, and then oh, don't even get me started on talent. 
This is the first 10 years. This is the first 10 years. <laughs> I think. I mean, there's some businesses where it's like three years, and then you're out of the starting blocks. You know, there's some, and especially like businesses where, you, where you're, you're the product, right? Like law firms or accounting firms. It's like three years, then you're gone. Speaking businesses. Three years, you're gone. But a business where you're scaling, yeah. Yeah. come on. It's scale. Like yeah. next year, I'm solving a problem I didn't know I was gonna have. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ask me what the standard operating processes is. I don't even know what the process is. <laughs> I don't understand that. I don't know anything. I'm trying to figure this thing out, right? Yeah. So, so I think if we can just be honest with each other and say the following: yeah. None of us have the answer. We're just all trying to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And as we figure it out, we share it with each other. We're like, oh, yeah. dude, when you get to this stage, try this. Right? This is really, really a cool way of doing it. Yeah. This is my approach. So this is why I'm friends with guys like Giovanni. It's not. It's for no other reason other than mm -hmm. I know there's something he knows mm -hmm. that when I learn from that, oh, that's going to save me that problem. This yeah. is great. You understand? Yeah. So there have been several instances like this, my brother. Like several instances, and it's fine. It's okay. It's mm -hmm. the name of the game. You, you do what you do. You learn what you learn, and and yeah. I think that the scorecard of entrepreneurship should be two things. How many lives did you change? Mm -hmm. How much wealth did you create? Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Whether or not you had a thousand followers on Instagram or your Twitter profile was verified, I'm not sure that that matters. Mm -hmm. How many lives did you change? Mm -hmm. How much wealth did you create? Mm -hmm. yeah. And guys, for me personally, and remember this one day when I'm no longer on this earth, mm -hmm. tell them that Pussy said. Mm -hmm. That's the only scorecard I want you to measure your life. Wow. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Mm -hmm. just, just that scorecard. That's why for me, Doing master classes is important. That's why when I'm in Tanzania, I reach out to Jumani and go, Yo, how do we reach out to So I'll be in country, I'll reach out to my brother and go, Dude, I'm in your country. Can't you pull together some entrepreneurs? Let's have a conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's because that impact for me is, is important. We, we appreciate that. You know how much people pay to listen to. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can pay for it. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so guys, with that, I expect... Okay, you say it's a few more. Yes, yeah, take them, three more, then we're done. Okay. This, three more. This lady is going to kill you because she's wow. waiting for wow. I was waiting for that. So one, two, three, four. Others you can follow on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so start with you. Okay, um, hello. So we're all building something, right? Yeah. So we have to grow up and get a job and then go into the job. And then mm -hmm. high chances some of us are already there in the job. Mm -hmm. But we have this build something that wants me to build something. But I don't know how to begin or maybe I've already begun and I'm I'm in the side hustle space where mm -hmm. I would work after work. You know? mm -hmm. How do you get to build it and start requesting for VCs and funds and get into this whole entrepreneur world? Easy. Come see this guy. <laughs> that, and that's, that's an honest answer, it's literally what he does. Yeah. So, um, I know we're all entrepreneurs here, most of us I imagine, and if you're not an entrepreneur, you're like, you're thinking about it, etc, etc. But I want you all to remember here that there are people called intrapreneurs. Mm -hmm. These are people who work in large organizations that bring that mindset of innovation into the large, large organization. And you know something? They actually have a much greater impact than we'd like to think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you think about a story like Apple, wow. and you think about uh, the iPad, the iPhone. If you think about how Steve Jobs went from the Lisa to the Macintosh, mm -hmm. right? It's not just because Steve Jobs was an entrepreneur, it's because he hired yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah. You know when you go to an Apple store, um, that beautiful ambiance mm -hmm. and the way that they designed that store, mm -hmm. that's because the CEO of Apple, um, the lady was the CEO of Burberry. And she came into Apple and she completely redesigned how those stores work. I don't know if you know this, but they have a manual for the angle at which every device must be tilted. Did you know that? Wow. Yeah, they think this is fascinating. Like they figured out with the luminescent lighting <laughs> at what angle the screen is bright enough for you to see, but not so bright you see what's on it. Wow. So when you approach it and touch it, it lights up. Just that, that's entrepreneurial thinking. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. But she found a way to apply herself and plow her skills in a large corporate. So I, I'm just saying that we, you know, we also need to be careful not to demonize people who work in large organizations. Like, there are some people who are very good at that, yeah. 
but they make sure that when they're part of the organization, they kick ass and take names. Yeah. Because for every superstar entrepreneur we talk about, you know, there's like a hundred people who mm -hmm. make sure that that superstar entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. Yeah. Right. So, so, so yeah. You know, if it's the side hustle and you enjoy it, make it the side hustle. If you want to make it a main hustle, make it a main hustle. There's no wrong or right answers. The journey you're about to go on, there are about a hundred people who've been on it before. The best piece of advice I can give you is find them yeah. and sit with them and ask all the questions and be relentlessly curious and be an ever-evolving student. I launched a mentorship platform called VT, in fact, I think there it is, VT Club 100, right? Mm -hmm. I launched it for exactly this reason, because I was getting 100 people going, get it, and I was like, okay, we're gonna create a platform, it's a mentorship platform, everybody come on it, and we're gonna teach each other and learn from each other, all right? And so even though I convene it, it's got entrepreneurs, and in fact, not just entrepreneurs, but professionals from all over the world, right? Um, and th the idea behind it is that for the path you're about to walk, somebody's already been there. So just ask, raise your hand, and go, hey, how do you do this? We're busy, we're busy like, so we're busy raising a, a series of funds now, because we're at that stage where we've proven the thesis, so we want to scale. Her technological efficiency is better than mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, one of the things about geography is geography is a source of capital. Yeah. There are some people who are wealthier than you, not because they're smarter, they just were raised in a different country. They went to a different school, and so in that country, creating wealth is easier. This is why Mark Zuckerberg doesn't post pictures of his private jet. Because where he's from, it's just a jet. <laughs> I was trying to explain this to someone, I don't know if you guys know, you know when Mark Zuckerberg came to Africa? When he was in Kenya, I think it was in Kenya, Nigeria. Do you remember the picture that was taken of him? Or you don't remember it? Mm -hmm. The only picture taken of him was Mark Zuckerberg at like a Nyamachoma, you guys call it. Like Shisanyama, mm -hmm. eating with his hand. How come that was the picture taken of him, not the one landing in the jet? Because that, to you and me, is every day. To him, it's novelty. <laughs> but the jet, to him, is every day. <laughs> to you and I, it's novelty. <laughs> so the point, the, point, it's a, the point I'm making is like, geography is a form of capital. <laughs> Where you are based is, is a form of capital, if you know how to manage it. Anyway, so this particular lady, I'll go back to the story. I eventually reach out to her and I go, dude, I keep getting your stuff. You are either working 25 hours a day, or you have built a hell of a machine. She's like, but was, this one connects to that one, has an API with that one, it does this. I'm like, wait, can you teach me? <laughs> True story. We scheduled a meeting, and, she's, and now behind the scenes, she's helping us build the entire backbone of wow. this. Wow. Just wow. learn. Just like <laughs> learn, be exposed, talk to people, learn from people. You'll be okay. You know? Um, thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, my question is, um, for businesses and founders, what would be your advice amid this rising inflation and when this um, global recession is imminent? I have no answer. Rising inflation, global recession? Man, I skipped that class in economics. Um, no, really, I, I, I genuinely have no advice. I think. I think great businesses will survive. I think good founders will find a way to maneuver. Um, I think we are agile, we'll find a way to be agile. Uh, from my perspective, you know, in South Africa, we've got that at Apple. I tell him all the time, I was like, dude, you couldn't pay me to do your job. You couldn't pay me to be a reserve bank governor or something like this. To try and control something I have no control over. I mean, using an instrument of economics we all know doesn't win. <laughs> You're going to hike interest rates. You've been doing it just for like. like it, it's, not, it's not like you hike interest rates and buying stocks, right? It's a, um, you, you know, it's it, like to regulate like, pandemics. Yeah. I, I heard, I heard, I heard, uh, so, you know, I have a lot of respect for that hangout. I think he's probably one of the brightest minds of my time. I, I, I actually heard him the other day doing an interview, they were talking to him about this like, inflation thing, et cetera, et cetera. And so the radio interviewer, Bruce, who's, who's a good mate of mine, Bruce is like, so, you know, beyond, you know, uh, the uh, monetary intervention, what else can you do? And he said, Bruce, this is the most effective tool we have in the modern system of economics. It's not to say it's the one that works all the time, but it's the most effective one we've got. I just think as fond as man, it's not something I worry about. Um, it is what it is, because I live in a world where I know everybody will do what they need to do. Yeah. The tax man will do what the tax man needs to do. The Ports Authority is going to do what the yeah. Ports Authority needs to do. The lawyer is going to do what the lawyer needs to do. 
you know, the bank's going to do what the bank needs to do. I'm going to make sure that I do what I need to do so that as all of this is being done, I can open my doors tomorrow and still have a business. And if it means I push up prices, then I push up prices. I need to make sure I stay competitive. I need to make sure I can make any decisions that I don't overcharge, that I, I don't make super profits. Yeah, sure, all of that stuff. But I'm going to do what I need to do. The, the actual expression that they use it at McKinsey is control the controllables. Okay? So just focus your mind on controlling the controllables. Okay? You just can't control that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not within your remit of control. So let those who are paid more to be smart and do that, do that. That's their gift. Paul. Yeah, so uh, mine is uh, straightforward. So uh, in the general businesses, there are a few terms that keeps repeating skills, capital, talent, exposure, networks. I know uh, they're very important, but what would be the best order in, in terms of moving forward? Like, which comes first, especially? I don't know. First, I don't know that that list is exhaustive. Uh, and second, I think it, uh, the answer I want to give is that it actually probably depends on the stage of the business that you're in. I think in the early stages, what you do is more important. As you grow, who you do it with becomes more important. And as you grow beyond that, how you do what you do becomes more important. So, so this is this is kind of for me naturally the way I would think. But I think in the early stages, just be good at doing. He's a videographer, right? Yeah. If he's a one-man show, he must just take good feed. So basically, talent network capital. I was looking at it as, as you grow. I would go. So what you do is more important. So, so, so first, core skill and competency. Mm -hmm. So that is talent. That's yeah, talent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, as you grow, uh, who you do it with. So you're right, talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and then network, mm -hmm. the people you work with. Quite mm -hmm. right. And then beyond that, how you do it. Mm -hmm. So yes, capital, technology, mm -hmm. etc., etc. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, why would you ask that question? It's such a philosophical. <laughs> <thing. laughs> I feel like he's asking me. <laughs> Yeah, so to me, uh, I feel like different order depending on the environment, mm -hmm. what you're doing. But probably, let's say in the US, talent maybe comes first, or capital comes first, but I wanted to get a picture of it. No, but the, the, the guys at, uh, you know, Grant Cardone? That's yeah. so Grant Cardone with a, a guy called Brandon created this thing called Cardone Ventures. It's a, it's a really cool platform, actually. But they have this like thesis of graduation of businesses, mm -hmm. and they and they it's a thesis, but their thesis goes at these stages, these are the things that are important, right? Oh, wow. So, uh, the reason I'm happy, it open and free? Yeah, it, it's it's grand free, <laughs> it's forty thousand dollars. It's forty thousand dollars. So, look, join VT Club. <laughs> You get the first month free. Right? You get the first month free. That's the promo code, guys. So, um, but, 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 so, so to add to, to buy the like, phone, I need to boost drug. Yeah, I'm very careful with what I pay for. Go to VT Club and trust me. So, 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 uh, it, uh, this thing about stages of growth, for me, is important in this way. That any of you here who currently are employed and are thinking of starting a business? Hands up, don't be shy. Yeah, this is the challenge they have. Mm -hmm. It's because you come from an organization where the rules are set, there's like line functions, departments, reporting lines, yeah? There's, there's like processes and stuff. And so you are working in an organization where you're so far up the gradient that the organization is about things like thematic leadership and culture development and that type of stuff. And then when you start your business, it literally is about just making sure the stuff gets delivered on time. So you go from this how world to what. And what is very practical. And what can happen, and I've seen this happen, is you can get so, so involved in what you forget to scale. So, so then you're just, you ever seen those people who run a business for 10 years and it's the same? Mm, yeah, because yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's where they, they just get good at the what. Okay. And then they don't go, okay, <laughs> I've fixed this. How do I make sure that I put in more capital so I can employ people who can help me take it to the next stage? Okay. Anyway. So one last one. Uh, Mr. that's the last one, because you really need value chains. 
and the ecosystems. So what has been your experience, particularly in the market whereby you find you, you, the business is in, but if you look at the value chain, it's really fragmented. You have to do multiple things as a, a, a company mm. to, to achieve. Mm. Because every time you look for your peers that can give you a particular uh, uh, service that is part of the value chain, they are either non-existent or they are not operating at the capacity that you wish. Mm. An example for the culture sector. And I'm a very happy Japanese here today. But again, <laughs> in that very same category, you find that as, as you build the value chain, now you get to the point whereby now you have to build an ecosystem, whereby you have the financing part, probably, um, the production part, the other supplies, etc. Also, you, you face the same particular problem. Hmm. What would be your, your advice? Because that is, in my experience, is a typical African yeah, yeah, context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know this question. The answer is actually very simple. Build it. There's no, everything you're saying is true, but everything you're saying is exactly why you should build it. Yeah. So my advice, build it and, and build it well. And if you're operating at, so for instance, there is no structured lending products for people operating in your sector. Build them. You know something, I don't know if you know this, but you know, there are a lot of businesses that didn't start out as the business they became. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like someone started doing something and they were like, wait, wait, wait. Actually, there's a problem here. Mm -hmm. And then they go, they do that thing, right? So bigger than the core business. Build it, okay, go build it. Don't just, if, if, it's a, if it's a problem or it's an opportunity, find a way for you to do it. <clears throat> and then the last thing, I would imagine you've got competitors, right? Yeah. Right, which means if you're facing the problem, what do you think are the odds they're facing the same problem? Exactly. So then therefore, Tell them into your if this is true, and it is, if you build it, you just have customers now. <laughs> Not competitive. Not competitors. Because you started out selling postage stamps. You then figured that nobody was printing postage stamps, so you created a printer and a printing press. And now every person selling postage stamps is your customers. Okay. This, is, this is what I would do. Great, thank you Good. so much, Musi. Can we give another round of applause? Thank you.